I'd like to welcome all of you. I apologize you can't see my face, but that might not be a bad thing. Um, this is going to be a very interactive, fast-paced webinar, so be ready to put on your thinking caps and add your thoughts in. We're going to learn about using high-yield strategies with student portfolios. My name is Liz Thomas. I'm located in Winchester, Virginia with Frederick County Public Schools and I'm an instructional technology resource teacher at Millbrook High School. I use Twitter. Um, I'm starting to use it more this year than I have in the past, so I'd be delighted if, if you would follow me on Twitter. If you don't have a Twitter account, uh, as an educator, I strongly urge you to get a Twitter account and start tweeting out good things. I am HAPAR certified, as Evian mentioned. I'm also a National Teacher Training Institute Master Teacher and a Google Certified Educator. I have given you a link to um, a website that bookmarks all the resources I've used. I'm not going to click on the link right now, but I'll show you that later on. The essential questions that we want to consider today are why to use high yield strategies with digital portfolios and how to use them with digital portfolios. Your learning outcome should be that you want to be able to choose several high yield strategies and also evaluate digital portfolio examples as they're related to the use of high yield strategies. So what does a digital portfolio look like? It could be something as simple as a cloud-based collection of folders for the digital portfolio documents that you are sharing with the students and they're evidencing their work. I, know, I found a world language teacher who was using VoiceThread, which is a website that allows you to interact and upload videos, audio, and all these things. But then the students had to embed some of those components into a Google site. As students are going into the high school years, particularly once they've turned 18, they can even create their own sites. Some students use other um, sites other than Google sites. There are a lot of them out there, and I have um, some examples of, of how you could use other things. Some teachers have students create digital portfolios with slide decks. At the lower elementary levels, a lot of teachers use a class blog, and then the teacher posts digital learning of students that way. I'm going to share a story about myself, about my grandson, who calls me Graham Cracker. He's my pride and joy. When I think about him, last year he was in kindergarten and he was getting sight words and uh, starting to identify words when he saw them, come up with words for homework that had the same sounds. And then this year now he's reading and I'm going, gosh, I wish we had a digital footprint of these things that he's doing, of showing his learning and progress. And wouldn't it be wonderful if I could see all of that when he goes through his um, under the, his high school, middle school, elementary, all that career, if it was in a digital portfolio that showed that progression, it would be wonderful. I have a couple of people here that with quotes that I'm not going to read them to you, um, but there they are. You can go back and reference them later. One of my favorite people is a Google innovator named Justin Burke. Bill Vipsler, and I loved his quote from his blog that he runs. He said, as a teacher, he needs to be accountable for looking for specific moments of success and greatness, and I think if you do a, a, a really good digital portfolio with students, you're going to be doing that. Here's your first chat question. So I want you to think about this quote, and then what kind of connection between teachers using digital portfolios and Google's method of hiring future employees? 
you're only going to have about a minute and a half to respond to this. Google doesn't even ask for your transcript. You go onto the website for job listings, the word college does not even appear, and 15% of their hires don't have a BA degree at all. What do they do now? They rely on structured interviews and evidence, the key word being evidence. So if you'll go into the chat and put your thoughts about that, I would love to hear what you're thinking about it. Real life scenarios, I like that. That's very true. Showing progress and growth, that's excellent. The test scores don't show it all. What you can do versus what you know. I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you. Those are good responses. Uh, we're going to move on. There are three types of portfolios. The showcase where you display final products or best works. The process portfolio that is used for formative assessment. You're capturing the process of learning and the growth. Then in some instances there is a combination portfolio. We call it a hybrid. And we're going to look at all of those in one way or another this evening. We're getting ready to look at an example of how all of those high yield strategies that are displayed on the left are used in a digital portfolio. And some of the things I want you to think about when we're looking are based on Marzano's nine strategies and I earmarked two of them about um, working, students working in cooperative groups and then setting objectives that adapt to their learning goals and providing feedback for those goals. The other thing is John Hattie's made an analysis study of over 1,200, well it's based on 1,200 studies. And the latest findings from him say that the, the most effect on the student learning is self-reported grades, which deals with a student before they start a new learning has to think about what they believe their success is going to be before they do any goal setting. And that is a powerful influence on their learning. If the student thinks about that and the teacher reflects on what the student has said. So let's take a look at this based on that. If this is going to be really intense, these, these, uh, this slide deck and the digital site portfolio, because I am going to land bash you all with a bunch of high yield strategies that are used first in the slide deck. Some of them are repeated in the port, the uh, Google site. So let me give you a look see at this um, digital portfolio that a teacher created. So save us a little bit of time. I'm not going to put it in full view. So the teacher gives an intro. Each student has to fill out information about themselves with their interests on a slide deck and add a picture of themselves. These are the units they're going to study in art. As they progress from one unit to another, they'll come back to this slide and they're going to put their goals about what they want to learn. And that's part of that self-reported grade. They're going to have to uh, have reflection. And they're going to have to be able to each week say, this is my goal for the week. This is how I, what I want to learn, how I'm going to have success doing that, what I'm going to do to make it happen. I have a link to it. I'm not going to open it up because you really don't need to see it. You can look at it later if you like. Then at the end of the, the each unit, they're going to be asked these questions. They have to take a picture of the final artwork and they will do that for the painting, the printmaking, the sculpture, each one of those units there will be a different slide deck for them. In addition, as they move through the course, they're going to go in and put in their own words what these vocabulary terms mean. So this is an ongoing slide deck that they'll be working on throughout the whole course. Another component of it is they're going to research an artist and they have to insert artwork, answer specific questions, and then the teacher of course gives them some resources. So 
these are some of the high yield strategies that the teacher used in a slide deck. What I did was take what they had done and I created a template, but I also gave them more. So the home of about, this is what the course is about. The About Me page doesn't look any different. I see some of, some of you saying overwhelmed. Is it because I'm going too fast or? Um, no, we're, we're, okay. we're uh, happy with being overwhelmed. There, we'd rather be okay. overwhelmed than underwhelmed was my statement because you said you were going to just push us full of information and we're ready for it. So keep on going. Okay, good. All right, so the art goals is, is, are the same. Now I want to show you the goal setting diary. When I go to that page, notice that if, if I have my students sharing their websites with each other because it's all contained within our district. It's not going out there globally. It's, it's protected. And however, some of these components you as a teacher may not want other students to see. And I'm going to give you an example for you to think about that. So the student is going to share their document that's down in their Google Drive. That's the goal setting diary. That's their self-reflection component that they may do. Uh, I know one of my art teachers, the student does this art journal every every week uh, with the kids and they can go in and, and add to it more often if they like. But it's up here in the website where it's easy for the teacher to get to, easy for the child to get to and they just click on their link and only they and the teacher see it. That weekly self-peer reflection piece, what I did, and if you go in and look at that rubric that I had gotten from you know, this other uh, teacher, that to me it was a hot mess, and so I turned it into a Google form. The students every week go in here, they have to self-reflect about, well, this was what my goal was that I put in my goal setting um, diary, and this is what I succeeded with, this is what I didn't. And then they have to tell about, assess their own participation in class that week, followed up by choosing three students, or the teacher can choose who they're going to evaluate. And so they evaluate each other. The peer feedback, now this is the one where y'all might go either way with it. I set it up so that the peer feedback responses are showing up on the web page. Here's where you have to know your students. There are going to be some students who will be okay with this, and there's going to be some who won't. So you need to give them the opportunity to decide whether or not this is going to be shared visible or if it's only going to be shared where the teacher can see it. I'm not going to teach you how to do that tonight because we don't have time and that's not what we're here for. I'm here to give you ideas. Artifacts, I broke it down into separate pages. So if I go to painting, here's the painting peer feedback. That's on the finished product of the students. And so a, a student comes to, let's say this is my, I'm an art student. Johnny's in my class. He comes to this page on my site and he's going to give me feedback because what he's going to do, he's going to see a picture of my artwork here. He's, and he will give me feedback. You can have all the students, students give each other feedback, or you can break it down into smaller groups. On each of my units, I have a page like this, and I have to go down, and I have to add my own reflection on my site. I will probably use the peer feedback to help me answer number five next time I will. So you're getting a lot of those high yield strategies built into this thing. Resource and research, that's not much different. Here's a couple of things that I've built in. Slide deck. Yeah, I'm going to have the kids create a slide deck and they're going to build upon it all year long. They're going to share how their learning grew. And so they're going to have these different slides that they will actually open up in their drive. Here's their painting unit. 
they're going to show me pictures from their journey and their journal entries that document their growth and learning. They're going to insert two images. This is what it looked like when I was starting out. Maybe a picture of in my journal. These were my goals when I was starting out. And then here's what it looks like at midpoint. Because the final product is going to show up on those individual pages for painting. And uh, so you're, you're getting a lot deeper with the learning by adding something like this. And then the tweet week. This is a little bit on the teacher, but not so much. One of the reasons I'd like for you to tweet is because with a tweet week, a teacher only has to tweet maybe once a week. And what they do is they pick something that a student has done. Like in this instance, if you look at what's said there, the student decided, okay, to help me start setting my goals, I'm going to create this mind map of things that I might use because my, my painting is going to be about the brain and all these different things. So I'm going to build this and then I'm going to figure out my goals based on that and pick out the things that I want to use from this to build that painting. And then what the teacher does, tweets it out, but the student has to take the image that's used in the tweet and then talk about it. What, did, what was my teacher wanting me to do? And how can I start thinking about my project? How did this help me? Uh, what did my teacher think about it? And then the fact that the parents are following the teacher on Twitter, so dad retweeted it to the grandparents, and the grandparents sent them money. How cool is that? How are we doing on our time, Evian? Um, you're you're at eight nineteen. You're good. Just keep barreling forward. You can uh, just okay. Good. We're we're in it. All right. So um, as we move on to the next slide, another high yield strategy with using student portfolios is one of Marzano's nine effective strategies teachers can use identifying similarities and differences. So here's one from a um, history class based on the Civil War that the, the student created this um, document. The teacher just took out their phone, took a picture of it, and then they tweeted it out, told the student, okay, this is going to go into your digital portfolio. And so that's, that's really the student owning the learning because they're doing the thinking, they're creating the work and then it's getting shared out. Another example from the elementary level, in a math class, the teacher has the students keep a journal of their under, checking for understanding for the day. The kids put this into their journal and they show their understanding. This was good, for the, particularly this child usually has trouble with his learning, so the teacher took the picture and that was the tweet of the week. What are the children doing? They're summarizing, and that's another one of Marzano's high yield strategies. So here's your next chat question. Are you ready? We're going to look at the other seven of Marzano's strategies. And what I would like for you to do, we covered the first two. Let me see if I can load this a little bit quicker. Let me go here. Okay, if you'll click on the link that's in the slide presentation, and if you can't, you can just look here on the screen. I'm going to scroll down to this second page. Look at the strategy, and then are there any of these things that you do? And if so, pick one, and then tell me how you would use it in a digital portfolio. Yes, cooperative learning is great value. Don't forget to hit the send button when you put in the responses.
the graphic representations of material is very powerful. And it's easy for a teacher to take photographs of these things and then tweet them out to the world. There's a lot of power to that and student validation. All right, we're going to move on. I'm, I'm seeing some good thoughts there. Yeah, practice is part some, uh, it should be a part of some portfolios. It's not always a finished product. I strongly agree with that. We also need to look at the international standards for technology and education. The two I wanted to um, focus on tonight are empowered learner and also the creative communicator. And with the empowered learner, I'm not going to read the uh, NISI standard to you, but basically it's about using technology to seek feedback and to demonstrate their learning in a variety of ways. And the creative communicator is um, for students to publish or present their content for their intended audience. So what would that look like? Here's what I want you to think about with those two things we just talked about. Let's look at this middle school math portfolio. It's a horrible portfolio in my opinion. So let's take a look at it. Choose one of the questions to respond to. What do you think went wrong with it? Was the learner empowered? Or is the message customized to the intended audience? Here's what it looks like. The teacher created the video. The students can listen to uh, the screencast every day. And it gives them extra work time. What do you think, folks? Also, let me show you a couple of things here. Is the learner empowered? Who's owning this learning? How deep is the self-reflection or peer feedback? And what happens when they get into seventh grade? This is not a child who's in sixth grade. What happened? Are you surprised? All right, we're going to move on. I think you get the idea. We want to look at the SAMR model, which if you get to the modification level, that's good. If you get to the redefinition level, that's the best. So the, re, the redefinition level, that's where you're being transformative, and you're probably hearing that term a lot. That's where the, the children, the learners, are creating new learning tasks. They may be getting global feedback. So I want to share with you the Skype that was done with a teacher, uh, the teacher's class, and an author. And I'm scrolling down. I picked this one author that they mentioned. Her name is Lisa Ard. She had discussions with the students about uh, being an author. And this is the part that spoke to me. So she, uh, the teacher overheard a couple of the students discussing how they were going to buy little notebooks over the weekend so they could start recording their ideas. It's like, wow! When students are able to learn from an expert in a field, it takes their learning to a new level. I always love it when someone tells me or shows me that kids go above and beyond what the teacher is doing. So if I were that teacher, I would think about, you know, I'm going to start journals with these kids. And when I have someone like this, not only will I have the kids write about how that impacts on their, their learning, but how they're going to take that and what are their goals going to be as we move forward as writers in the classroom to develop them as writers.
So what else could be a way to transform the learning? Well, we've been working with one, that Twitter thing. I keep hitting this hard, but it, it really gets to that redefinition level. And you are validating the students and their learning and their, their growth and their learning. All right, we've looked at a lot of these high-yield strategies, and I'm going to be saving some time here at the end for you all to ask some questions. But I'd like to show you a little bit about how Hapara could fit in with the digital portfolios. So bear with me while I go to this other screen. Let me get there. All right. So as a teacher, if I have a par, there's some things that I can do with my students. Right now I'm going to show you this uh, workspace. So if I'm using workspace with that class, I can build the goals on this workspace for all the units. I can add all my resources. The students will give me evidence of their learning. But I can differentiate the instruction, or I can build in gradual release of the cards by using groups. So let's see what it looks like if I show you just what students in the painting group would see. When they log into their My Student Dashboard, all they're going to see are the cards that they need to build in that unit of study. And that, that's it. I, as the teacher, because we're looking at it from a teacher's perspective, I can see how many have started, how many have sub submitted, and whether or not I graded them just by looking at this page. If I go to the sculpture group, I only see the cards for that sculpture group. Now, I'm going to show you a few more things from the teacher's perspective before I move over to um, what things look like from a, a student's view. So if I go to the teacher dashboard, here are my students. I can look and see that Philip created his own website and that he's um, shared it with me. I can go in and look at it. I can also see that he started the self-participation, the self-reflection document. And if I look, well, wait a minute. In my little preview, I can see, yeah, he's got his copy of it, but he hadn't really put anything in it. So I might want to, since school's out of session right now, I might want to send him an email and say, hey, bud, don't forget, you need to have that, that filled in before you leave school on Friday. So I could just click on email and send it to him. If we were in class and I looked at that, I could go over here and I could send him a message by using the send message button. Now some of this I can't really show you all of it because I'm not logged into a school account as a teacher because I'm not a teacher. And some of this I'm blocked because of our district um, security. You can see no kids are logged in right now. And even if they were at our district, we have one-on-one. -on -one. But I could choose, if I could click on his name in this little drop-down, then I would pick his name and I could say to him, hey, fill up. Don't forget to build in your goals. And I might say thank you for remembering to, I'm not going to type it, it will just waste some time if you're watching me type. So I type in my message, I hit send message. I'm going to go to the help so I can show you what that would look like um, on his screen if we were in school and he had it, he was in the Chrome browser. So I'm going to put in uh, send message. And then I'm going to scroll down here to show you what that would look like. I know it's kind of hard to see, but can you see where my mouse cursor is? 
that's what the message will appear on his screen while he's working in the Chrome browser and he'll be able to read what I said. Hey, Philip, don't forget to fill in your goals. So that's another thing that we could do. Now, <clears throat> if I go to my activity viewer, if I had anybody logged in, which I don't, I could see what was going on with those kids. Unfortunately, you know, they're not in school and they're not working, so I can't see anything. So this, those are just a few of the ways that you can use dashboards from the teacher's perspective. And then I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to log out as my teacher account, and I'm going to log in as Philip. I want you to see what a student sees in the par. They don't, they only see workspace. So if you're not using workspace with students, the students have no need for um, doing anything. They would log in under my student dashboard. So first I'm going to log in as him. And then I will need to go to, it's called my student dashboard. And Philip logs in. It's going to show that he's in my class. He has three, right now, three workspaces. He needs the Art 10 one. He goes in and he looks. The unit, he, he's already finished his painting unit, his printmaking unit, but he's working on the sculpture unit. Notice the only thing that Philip sees right now are the cards that relate to the sculpture unit. So if you have a student who's easily distracted, this is going to help them just focus on what they need to be successful with this unit. He's got his goal setting diary. So if you're not doing a Google site, you're just using um, the cloud-based folders, this is a way you can do it. He can click on that. He doesn't even have to go up in his drive. Now I know that I'm going to get error messages because this is not a live class and, and our firewall is blocking us. But he could just click on the link, it would open up the file, and then he would be able to continue working. When he's totally completed it, he would hit the submit button. If it's a student who is being allowed to create their own site, maybe they're using Weebly or Wix or Kidlog or, or something like that, they can um, go in here and edit their site just by clicking on that link. I hope that um, the things that I've showed you have been a benefit and going to help you move forward and think about how you can use digital portfolios with high yield strategies in a way that you may not have considered before. So this uh, finishes the presentation component of our webinar and I'd be happy, I'm sure Evian and Heather as well would be happy to respond to any questions you might have. Comments, problems with digital portfolios, anything that you would like to share with us. Uh, make sure, and I'm going to show you the Padlet. I'm, I'm glad you all said something about that. Let me get out of this um, incognito window. So I told you that I had this Padlet bookmark, but Um, creating a template for students is totally up to you. It depends on how structured you want it to be. I'm that type person. I like a lot of structure. With art students, maybe not so much, particularly at the high school level. Um, the younger students may need that structure. Differentiation, you may have both. So, you know, you have to know your students, their way of learning, and what's going to work best for them. I never like one size fits all. So um, here's the Padlet, and all it is is a visual bookmark of resources I've shared with you so it's easier for you to click on those links instead of having to dig through the slides. I will be adding um, a couple more things to it, like the back channel that we have going there. I'm going to look at what you all said. If any of you are using digital portfolios, 
and want to take a moment to share a link with one of your portfolios, that would be awesome. You can always email me later and tell me what's going on with um, your successes, your failures. Because frankly, when I was hired for my current position, when I was interviewed and offered the job, I said, are you willing to let me fail? Because I think all of us need to try things and be willing to fail in order to improve the, the learning experience for the, the kids. So um, just hang in there, keep doing good things like I know you're already doing. You wouldn't be taking time out of your hectic schedule to sign up for a webinar if you weren't dedicated and innovative teachers anyway. Uh, and don't forget, in the slide presentation is the link to Padlet. I think it's like the third or fourth slide in. Yeah, so, um, threw it up on the chat yeah. as well. Sorry to barge in. Yes, that's wonderful. I've that's wonderful. Thank you. Throw those things on the chat as well. I, Absolutely. I love all of your um, all of your resources. They're wonderful. I love a bunch of your ideas, and you've thrown out so many ideas, um, kind of on a grand scale, which I like. Think, thinking about how to set up and how we want to use the portfolios, not just here's a great template for a portfolio, now go do it and have all your kids copy it. I think um, Liz's strategies for kind of thinking about Samer and Marzano and John Hattie um, and ways to really kind of ramp it up um, are my big takeaways from this. Um, I hope you folks have some big takeaways from this as well. Does anybody have any other questions or do you have um, I'll throw my camera up. Do you have suggestions of things that you're using or that you've been trying to use um, for your digital portfolios? Any platforms that your kids love um, or that your teachers love that you want to throw out that we haven't talked about? Um, I do want to make sure. So um, we are happy to provide you with a certificate of attendance for the webinar if that's something that you're interested in. I know some of you uh, might be able to get a little credit for that. Um, so I've thrown up a bit.ly, a short link um, to a quick attendance form that we've made also with a couple of feedback questions um, asking if if you'd like a certificate of attendance for this webinar. Uh, okay, so we've got Seesaw, which has been something that's been brought up a bunch. Um, our last webinar, we had teachers talking about Seesaw as well. Anything else that you folks are using? Brand, it's brand new to the elementary schools. Yeah, it's a great resource for the younger students. Um, I know there's good old Google Sites. Um, classic Google Sites or the old Google Sites works very well with Hapara. You can um, use kind of those dashboard links to see classic Google Sites. Unfortunately, it doesn't work quite yet with new Google Sites, which are quite a bit friendlier for students to use. Um, but you know, there, there are a lot of different things out there and then there's Weebly and all the other, uh, website edgy blogs that you can use as well. Um, regular old blogs, systems of folders and folders, um, the way you're going to do it, um, is, is part of the joy, but I think Liz has given us some great ideas for thinking about, uh, kind of what to include and what to think about when we are when we're working on it, when we're kind of planning, planning our e-portfolios and making sure that they're doing um, as much work as they should be. And they're not that kind of non-example. Sorry to whoever that teacher was that made that non-example. I'm sure you tried. <laughs> Liz, do you have anything else? Liz, will you actually, um, I think you had a couple more slides. Um, I know you have a last slide. We're just seeing your padlet. There we go. I just didn't want you to miss out on your, your hard-earned. Yeah, so um, I have added some planning tips and tricks because I truly feel that if you plan it out well, you build in that your work time as a teacher is pretty much in that planning phase. And if you build it well, the rest of it is just going to fall into place 
like you normally do things. You may add, take, take a little picture and tweet it out. Um, some helpful web, websites, when you get a chance, look at those three because some of the things that I thought of came from those three articles. So those are good ones. Another thing that I want you to um, make sure you do is fill out that feedback. I have a couple of questions in that about your takeaways from the webinar and then um, moving forward, you know, what are your thoughts, what do you, what do you think you're going to do next with what you've learned tonight. So don't forget about webinars are only as good as what your takeaways are and what you want to do with those takeaways. I agree. Thank you so much, Liz. This has been wonderful. I learned a lot. Um, I hope everybody else learned a lot and you kind of gather this information and then and spread it around too. So don't don't be stingy with what you've learned. Um, give Liz credit if you're using her slides or any of her information that um, we're all uh, very excited about kind of being a community and passing things on. We at Hapara will uh, grab your Twitter handles and follow you. So look forward to that. We can continue this conversation on Twitter as well, which will be very exciting. Um, anybody else have any last words before we sign off? Looks like a no. Um, thank you so much, Liz. Um, and everybody else, thank you everybody for joining us, Heather and everybody um, who joined in today and uh, we'll we'll see you on Twitter and we'll see you at our next uh, at our next webinar and we will also email you a copy of this webinar as well.